Security at Air Force Base. We have ICBMs, so security is kind of a big deal. Only thing that ever happened was some hippies jumped a couple fences and were hitting a hardened blast door with a sledgehammer, trying to sabotage the nukes. It was the top cover for a retractable antenna. They were nowhere near the nukes. Bored as, hanging out on the tarmac near a little used airstrip at one end of base. All air traffic comes through the other end. Security patrol starts screaming into radio that they have an unknown situation. Everybody scrambles, chambering pistols, grabbing M16. His patrol is still screaming into radio. Sounds scared crapless and isn't making any sense. Second patrol is dispatched to back them up and find out what the heck is going on. We're on standby in case they need additional backup. Don't even have Humvees. We're still rolling in old blazers. Suddenly, somebody calls over the radio reporting unidentified radar contact that isn't responding to Hale's cluster. As everyone scrambles to respond to that, they wheel an old as M-167 VADs out of the hangar and start loading it. Mother end of base reports they're loading up a pair of helicopters with an infantry squad each and arming the door gunners. What the actual is going on? Gunshots heard in the distance. Somebody's going full mad minute. Second patrol radios in, screaming, they need backup. Now we roll out there, but both patrols have literally circled their vehicles like a wagon train under attack by Indians and are hiding behind slash under them, scared crapless. We don't see anything. First patrol spotted what they thought was an animal on all fours until it stood up on its hind legs, ran and jumped over the fence. Freaking 12 feet fence topped with razor wire. They freaked out and called for backup. Second patrol shows up, calls BS. They split up to search for clues. Scooby-Doo style, first patrol spots it again, hiding in a drainage ditch. A guy in second patrol says another thing grabbed him from behind and lifted him off the ground. He panics and empties the magazine of his M16, fortunately not hitting any of our guys. Whatever has him drops him and jumps over a fence to join the first thing. Everybody freaks the heck out, circles the wagons, and establishes a defensive perimeter while crying for backup. These are Air Force guys who spend all night drinking coffee on a base in the middle of the U.S. during peacetime. They are not prepared for this. Crap, we roll up and help search for the monsters. We ain't found anything. Guys at other end of base are reporting a blue light hovering over the missile silos. Our choppers haven't finished loading up yet. Base commander says the light aircraft isn't ours, so smoke it. We hear the VADs open up and see tracers arcing into the night sky. Holy crap, that's beautiful. No explosion, nothing. We can't see the light from here thanks to a small hill radio. Reports that mysterious light shot over to the airfield after being fired on and presumably missed. Hovered for a few seconds, then disappeared. Entire base is scrambling. Anyone who wasn't awake already woke up as soon as the Vulcan opened up. Search entire base and perimeter. Nada, the entire thing is announced as a false alarm due to jittery nerves. Patrol guys put on leave for a couple weeks. Then when they come back, they're assigned to guard a different part of the base. I get assigned to patrol that area instead of my cushy spot back at security. HQ mother lover. Never see anything creepy or unexplainable the entire two years I'm there until I get out. So, yeah, I somehow managed to miss everything despite being in the middle of it. Long time lurker. First time poster on Exma. I'm generally a K guy. A few years ago we had decoration day up at the old family land. And I think I had a Bigfoot encounter maybe. Old Appalachian thing where it's kind of a family reunion. But we clean decorate the graves, have a church service, and cook out all in the cemetery. Family cemetery in the mountains of North Carolina close to the Tennessee border. On very old, American-wise, family land. And there are people from my family dating back to the early 1800s there. Along with apparently a number of Cherokee somehow related to us. So here's the short and easy of it. Me and a couple of distant cousins decide to go camping up on a ridge overlooking the farm cemetery one night, something we do every few years after decoration, beautiful view with minimal light pollution, all armed because bears are common and panthers aren't too uncommon to be seen. Everyone falls asleep except me and a cousin, you'll call him Dale, because we're night shift fags in the middle of a conversation. He stops, does a double take, and stares deadpan down the ridge at the cemetery. Dape squints and mutters, What the heck? I can't see anything Captain.jpg. Anon. There's people in the fucking graveyard. Jason mutters, What the heck? I can't see anything Captain.jpg. Anon. 
There's people in the fucking graveyard. Jesus Christ, they're huge. Wake up the other three and decide to go investigate. It's a three to four mile hike down through the woods, through the forest to get to the cemetery. And about 10 minutes into it, my hackles raise up. There's no cicadas, no owls or anything. I feel like I'm being watched. Start to smell something the closer we get to the graveyard. For any med guys, the closest I can compare it to is finding a dead fat guy decomposed in his trailer in mid-July and a basement mothballish mildewy smell. It's freaking horrible, everyone's on edge, but nothing happens the rest of the way down. Dale starts hyperventilating and pointing his S keys to the clearing. Way across the field behind the house, something freaking huge sprints fast as shit from behind one of the barns to the wood line, 130-ish yards. In seconds, Dale takes a few pot shots at the thing and we hear this squalling kind of like a giant bobcat with his nuts in a vice. Another call, similar sounds from behind us in the woods adjacent to the cemetery. Screw this, dot JPG. I'm so rattled at this point I just start running to the jeep. We rode down the holler in, and we all pile in. The dirt road into the land is about two miles of dirt roads hugging the edge of a drop-off and takes you to the main road at the top of the mountain. We're all armed and scare crapless all the way up the driveway and make it out on the main road. Spend the rest of the night at Waffle House, it's anticlimactic. But it was fucking terrifying. Move into house in the outback in South Australia in 2005. Pretty much every single person living in our street had only lived there for under five years, apart from an elderly couple that lived at the end of the street. This elderly couple had lived in the street for 40 years and had raised their children in the street. They said strange things happened in the street and a lot of people can't handle it and leave. They never really went into what scared people just say in the whole street was haunted or something like that, but they did say it only starting happening in the early 90s. First experience I had was a week after moving in. I heard a low-pitched humming sound coming from outside my bedroom window. When I looked out, I saw this tall black figure with long arms and long figures with no facial features. He was slightly transparent. He was backed up against the wall, holding up the garage area of my house. Due to its height, he had to hunch over. I was looking out for around five seconds before it realized I was looking at it. It turned its head towards me and I quickly ran away from the window and ran and told my parents. My dad went out and saw nothing was there. I sketched what I saw, pic related. I started hanging out with the neighborhood kids. We were all teenagers and they told me their stories and all described the same figures I had seen. One of the kids was Aboriginal and we would go visit his grandfather a lot. He called the entities My Yalmala, which translated roughly to Stranger Man. He said that the Aboriginals in the area had been dealing with them long before the arrival of Europeans and said that they weren't of the land, which kind of meant they didn't belong there or weren't native to there and that they would take children away and eat them. He said that the Aboriginals cast them behind the creek but since the creek partially dried up, the Mayalmula had once again been able to get into the town. The town that I lived in was built directly over the previous Aboriginal settlement. This Aboriginal tribe wasn't nomadic and had remained in a small area for over a thousand years. One day, me and my friends were playing cricket out on the flat patch of desert in between the road and my house. The sun was setting and as we were packing up our stuff, we noticed that there were people off in the distance approaching the road. The closer they got, the more details we could see and we noticed that they were fully black, tall and that they weren't walking but floating. We could also hear a low pitched humming sound that got louder the closer they got. We bolted back to my house and told my parents, but my parents once again didn't believe us. I hassled my father enough to drive down on his motorbike to the area we saw them approaching. After nine minutes, he came back to the house, visibly shaken, saying he saw them and that I wasn't to go down there anymore. Every time I tried to get details on what happened, he would always change the subject. One night I was coming home from a party with my friends and as we passed the empty lot in the street, we saw these two small figures sitting on tree stumps, just staring at us. One was bigger than the other and once again we heard a low pitched humming sound. We were all high as fuck and were just standing there, laughing, thinking we were tripping out until we realized that we were all seeing the exact same thing and we couldn't all be hallucinating the same thing. One of my mates, took a step towards the one closer to us and when he did it made this very deep growl. I had never heard anything like it and to make a long story short, we screamed and ran to my house. 
I'm mentioning this because unlike the tall figures I had seen, and I'd see them a lot at night, these things were completely physical and not transparent. They were shaped like babies but didn't have a neck. Now, this is where shit heats up. There used to be a group of kids that would take their dirt bikes beyond the creek and would go riding way out in the desert. One day, they didn't come home and everyone assumed they had just gotten lost. They were found a week later, all five of them. They were alive, with no food and no water out in the Australian outback for a week. What scared me was what one of the kids' younger brother told me. He said that his brother had said they saw a light out in the desert and they felt compelled to follow it. He said he felt like he was in a trance and they didn't stop following this light for the entire week they were out in the outback. He said no matter how far they kept traveling, they didn't seem to get anywhere close to it. He said if the farmer that found them hadn't have found them, they never would have stopped following the light and eventually would have died. Anyway, getting to the final part of the story. So my mother had gotten sick of me being scared all the time and called her sister who lived in Adelaide to come visit. She's a psychic or something. So she comes down, and the moment she pulls up, she tells us not to tell her anything about what we've seen, and that she's going to wander around the street for a while and come back and tell us what she saw. When she came back, she was visibly shaken. She told me that these things were unlike anything she had ever experienced, and that she had also run into the spirit of an old Aboriginal woman. The woman told her that her tribe were a split-off group from the Tharawal, and came to the area that would become the town I lived in to escape the Mayalmula, but the Mayalmula followed them. The woman then showed her horrific images of these things, slaughtering Aboriginal children and eating them through a small slit in their mouth. The woman then told her she drowned herself in the creek so she would act as a spiritual barrier to keep the Mayalmula out. She said this worked until a pyramid-shaped pathway was built facing the way the Mayalmula had come from. This allowed them to come in once again not the fact that the creek had dried up. The Aboriginal woman led my auntie down the path to show her something even more terrifying. After eating the small children, they would rebirth these kids to be their minions or some shit. My auntie said these beings are completely physical and live out in the desert and sometimes come into the town for food. She said these things are harmless and mainly just keep an eye on people for the Mayalmula. My auntie became confused and said if they were killing children just to make them into spies, then what was their motive in the first place? It was explained to her that the Mayalmula just seemed intent of inflicting pain and suffering on people. She said that they rape women and men alike, make women miscarriage, cause accidents and kill the weak. Despite this, they seemed to have a personal vendetta against the Aboriginal woman's tribe and seem intent on wiping them out. This is why they remain focused on the town. My auntie came to the conclusion that the Mayalmula aren't human spirits and aren't spirits at all. She believed that they were a physical, reproducing race of beings and are most likely aliens. She said she had heard of similar beings all around the world. After hearing all of this, we put the house on the market and began preparations to leave. A couple of days before we left, I went on one last motorbike ride where my father had told me not to go. While riding along a dirt path, I saw this rock on the side of the path. It was weird because it looked like it was smoothed down a bit and had some markings on it. I don't know if it's related at all to what had been happening. I personally think it's someone playing a joker because none of the engravings on it are Aboriginal and the engravings on it are all over the place. Anyways, I took it with me when we moved. Pick related. So yeah, this is my experience with the paranormal. Thought I'd share it with you all, and it'd be great if someone else had an experience like this that they could share. Rock with the engravings outlined. Gotcha, mate. He's going to send more when he decides to not be a lazy fuck. People keep making fun of Bunyip, but I'm not so sure. Be an Air Force completing officer training. Exercise Balik Papan. Pick related its me during first phase of exercise. Be based next to a swamp in bushland enemy Dao. Two weeks of digging trenches and security to defend airbase. 1.5 weeks into exercise of beyond Pakwit at 2.30 a.m. being annoyed at mosquitoes. Start hearing noises just outside of filed of observage in me. And other officer in training are like, shit, must be op 4. 
Being played by training staff, uh, activate our Gen 4 NVG scopes, no sight, wake, and consult section lead, who agrees. Us two need to investigate, get excited to be super army man, follow noise source, using best commando skills, thinking we're hot shit, noise is arising behind burn in our area, keep low and move to ridge top to investigate activity on other side, just swamp, not much going on, get disappointed, but sound is getting louder, starts to be weird smell, like a million times worse than wet dog, splashing to be heard on our right. Forgot to mention it was new moon, so NVGs are shit tier in relation. Spot shape. Roughly two meters in height on water edge, looks like someone stooped over signal to other guy that it's probably a sergeant must be washing something. Retreat down, burn to whisper course of action. Is this part of the exercise? Do we demand ID? Move back to top of ridge to OP. Shape has shifted to waist deep in water. Looks like it's looking straight down into water. Abu Abu TF is this guy doing? We need to make sure bloke is okay. You there? What's the magic number? Was 11 that night. Never forget. Shape turns. No other movement or noise. Not even in the water. Fucking WTF am I looking at through my NVGS? Just a human shape, no discernible features. Outline like it's covered in feathers. Shape just grunts. Just then get scared to pooping pants stage as someone grabs my mouth. Get rolled over. It's a corporal who silently drags me down the burn while a sergeant does same to my mate. Get put in ute and driven to HQ. Sat in dim light. Questioned. What did you see? What did you hear? Did we make contact? Friend and I shitting selves. No reportable contact made. Are you sure? Yes, sir. This is the weirdest exercise. Told we are to sit tight. Sit in and shed all night. Senior officer comes in. Morning. Ask same questions. Sat in room some more. Me and mate, too. Fucking tired. Unsure to talk to each other. Intelligence officer comes in. Same questions. Ask if we are happy to proceed with exercise. Don't want to let time down. Both agree. Told not to discuss this night ever again. It was a sergeant who had been diagnosed with mental stress. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Fair enough. Whole section is redeployed about 15 kilometers from original point and we rejoin them. Everyone acts as if nothing happened. On exercise debrief. Friend and I are taken aside and told not to reveal classified medical details. I will never forget that shape, the fucking smell, or the way the directing staff acted all fucking paranoid. Aboriginal tribal peoples tell tales of the Burrenjaw, the huge reptilian nocturnal creature that has devoured cattle, camels, and kangaroos. Ancient Aboriginal artwork displays a three-toed bipedal form with small front legs and a huge mouth. Clearly, this is something different from their easily distinguished kangaroo artwork. Even still today, Aboriginal peoples will fearfully avoid certain locales in which this creature allegedly was seen, and they will abandon areas for some time if tracks of the creature show up. These same telltale tridactyl prints have earned the monster the nickname Old Three Toes by locals to the east. In the state of Victoria, indigenous peoples call this same ferocious theropod the Murray Murray. Numerous sightings of Burunjaw footprints have now been locked across the outback. Pictures and casts show a consistent bipedal track with three huge toes between two to three feet in diameter. Alongside watering holes, along riverbanks, and even in dirt roads, the monster's footprints have been reason for alarm. According to testimonials, cowmen came across these monster tracks in the process of investigating missing livestock. The Burrenjor has a penchant for grabbing cows and carrying them off. Rex Gilroy's 2013 book, Burrenjor. The search for Australia's living Tyrannosaurus lists several such scenarios where cows, sometimes several in a single kill site, were found bitten in half 
and large bones were broken by massive jaws. The area around these kill sites was covered with massive tridactyl reptilian footprints. Recent sightings of the creature responsible for the massive prints and bovine butchery have been more rare. Burren jaws have been seen at night by truckers driving the Stewart Highway, which traverses long, lonely sections of the continent down under. Another report tells of man named Brian Clark, who went into the woods and got lost sometime during 1978. After the alarm was raised, he was tracked by policemen and two Aboriginal bushmen. The trackers woke up one night to a loud, thunderous sound and the ground shaking. After finding the wayward traveller, policemen later told the man that if he ever went back into the woods and got lost, that they would not come looking for him. Some think the sound was the stomping of the Burren Jaw. The Grand Caverns Cryptids. This photo was taken in 1895 by an amateur spelunker or photographer named Orrin Jeffries while exploring an unmapped section of Grand Caverns in southwestern Virginia. At the time it was taken, Jeffries was conducting photographic experiments using super long exposures to see if anything at all could be captured in the total absence of light, otherwise known as cave darkness. He would situate himself on level ground, extinguish his lantern, and then open the lens of his homemade box camera for as long as he could stand the darkness. During one of these experiments, he heard something approach from the deeper recesses of the cave. Frightened, Jeffries abandoned his experiment and set off one of the blitzlicked flashes he used for taking traditional photos underground. According to the report he later gave to a local newspaper, Jeffries saw three humanoid creatures staring at him from the shadows and took off running in the other direction and didn't stop running until he was topside. Several days later, he returned with three other men to retrieve his box camera. This is the image that was recorded on the film inside. Hey X, I've got something interesting enough to bring me out of lurking. I hope some of you can perhaps give me some insight as to what the hell I saw. I was just another eight or nine year old kid living in Mormon land, Utah, wasting his summer vacation while life was still fun. Out behind my house, practically in my backyard, was a huge dike at the mouth of a canyon coming from some nearby mountains. There was a drainage pipe that acted as an outlet for the little water that came down from the canyon at the base of the dike, right above this big pile of accumulated sand, was the perfect natural sandbox with the perfect natural garden hose providing a constant steady trickle of water. It was easily visible from the back windows of my house, and this allowed for my mom to watch me play from within the house, and she'd let me mess around all day at the base of the pipe. Was a huge dinosaur nut, and had a bunch of those nice cool Carnegie collection models that a destructive kid like me should never have. Would take a bucket full of these out to the natural sandbox every day, and would create little river systems and immerse myself in the anarchist society I created for, of my dinosaurs, sitting out in the sun for hours and getting sunburned pretty much every day with a neighborhood kid who tolerated me. Did this on and off for the majority of the first half of the summer. Nostalgia, sad. In mid-July, as it happened every year, it started to rain more, and one night we got hit with a decent thunderstorm. Lay in bed that night, no doubt, anticipating the new environment I'd have to play in the next day. Got up at an hour which no doubt pissed off my parents, not bothering to wait for my friend and headed right out to my little natural sandbox. A significant amount of water was coming out of the pipe, and a small pond had formed where I usually played. I played with my lake for about half an hour as the sun rose a little. It had to be seven or eight in the morning. Was sticking dinosaur toys in the shallow mud and trying to balance some on pieces of floating wood debris when something floated next to my little hands. I went to push it away because it was on a collision course with one of my improvised boats but ended up recoiling. You know when you're a little kid and something startles you so badly that you don't scream, but you just kind of stare and retreat back a little with your heart jackhammering? That's what I did. Thing was about the size of a guinea pig, and I use an animal as a size comparison, because it was definitely an organic thing, but it sure wasn't any animal or living thing I had ever seen or have ever seen since. It still freaks me out to think about it floated in that low current region at the edge of the pool for a few seconds. And I got a decent look at the thing. 
It had that fatty, pink-gray, waterlogged color of something that's been dead and in water for a little while, but not yet falling apart. It had a head torso, from which trailed half a dozen or so tentacle-like things, splayed out around it in the water, and a couple dragged in the mud. It was hairless, and didn't look like it had ever had hair. But it wasn't scaly either. And it had a fucking face. Not a human face, not even close, but a face. It reminded me slightly of the face of a pug or bat. It was wrinkled and flat. It had a toothless, slack, open mouth, and I could see one of its eyes, which was that dead custard color, scared the fuck out of me so much that all childish desire to examine or poke it with a stick was gone. I quickly retreated back to my house and told my mom what I had seen. My mom seemed worried and even interested, and accompanied me back out so I could show her. By then the current had carried it away, along with a couple of my dinosaurs, which was almost as upsetting as seeing the thing itself. We looked around and found one of the dinosaurs, but never found the thing. I was too nervous to play there for the next couple days, which worried my parents because I really loved playing out there, and they tried to convince me it was just a decaying dead animal. Eventually got over it and went on playing. A few years later, when I was 13 or 14, the whole incident came back to my mind and I explored up the canyon to see if I could find anything, which I didn't, I never forgot seeing that thing. I know it could partly be explained away as the result of a creative, childish mind, or that it really was the decomposed remains of something else. But I remember it very clearly, more clearly than any other childhood memories, and the thing was really clearly defined and seemed very whole. I had searched the internet for explanations and haven't found anything. I've even looked into cryptids and the like. The globsters kind of remind me of it, hence the pictures, but it was much, much more clearly composed. What the hell was it? All right, 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 righty, right. X. One of you has to know something about what's going on here. I'm going to write this out as my thoughts come, so please don't expect a well-edited story with great writing. All cards on the table this time, I need some fucking help. Little backstory to provide some context. My name is Jesse, I'm 20 years old, and I live in a town called Waymate in New Zealand, in a house with a flatmate named Matthew on Mortimer Street. Pick related. Lovely town, 6,000 people. They're all a bit odd, but that's to be expected from small town people. Our neighboring towns, Timaru and Oamaru, like to joke that there's something in Waymate water. Makes us all a bit different, you know? So I'm about six foot tall and I weigh 49 kilograms. That's 108 pounds for all the Americans reading. Also, don't tell me to eat some fucking food. I've stayed the same weight since I was 12. There's nuke I can do about it. I've done a fair amount of drugs in my time. A lot of weed, plenty acid, some coke, some E. I know what they're like, how they make you feel. It's an augmented reality when you're on them and your brain can sort of tell that this is the case. Not the same feeling as what I just got and I can't make heads or tails of it. The drug I want to try next is shrooms. They grow wild. I've been searching. This is what happened today starting at around 5 p.m. Basically every day I go out hunting for the growing gold and every day so far I've had no luck. Not a single active. So today I decide I'll do something different. I won't just walk around where I usually do I'm going to go out early and take a nice long walk out into the bush, and surely I'll find something. I get dressed in my usual getup, freshly dubbed boots so my feet don't get wet walking through the grass, my jacket I've had for five years, still waterproof, hat, and a pair of thin leather gloves. It's been raining the past few days pretty hard, providing the best weather conditions for optimal shroom growery, and it's finally calmed into a light drizzle overnight. I left my house just before 5 a.m., walked down the street, through the small stream, and into some pretty light bush coverage. Checked all my usual spots and again, nothing special. I was knelt down looking through some ferns, because Piweraroa tend to grow close to them, no birds yet as it's still a bit too early, can hear the stream running behind me and out of fucking nowhere at about 5.30 a.m. I hear this loud bang on the corrugated iron fence directly in front of me. Sort of like someone had thrown a medium-sized rock at it. I go take a look and there's nothing. 
No animals, no people, houses far away. Just to feel it to myself as the fence warming up a bit in the air. I notice my hat is a bit wet and I can feel it's cold on my forehead. No biggie, time to keep walking. At this point I'm fine, feeling fine. Not a care in the world except for finding my bloody mushies. So I walk out in the bush and I just keep walking for about an hour. I've gone past all the farms and I'm nice and deep into some uncharted mushroom hunting territory. Sun still hasn't come up but it's thinking about it and I've started hearing wildlife. Birds all out in force. Heard a farmer going to his dogs in the morning and all their excited barking. Feeling really good and then all of a sudden just not. Not feeling good at all. It's difficult to explain the exact emotion. Think of it like, you've just been informed the only thing you care about in the world has just been taken from you. First thing I felt, psychically, was the coldness of my hat was gone. I was sweating and I never sweat. Not when I run, do heavy lifting, get to the final two in a game of PUBG. I just don't sweat. Then I noticed my hands were hot, sweaty palms in my gloves. I'm just standing there in the bush feeling this way. I didn't want to move. In fact, I felt compelled to not move. Maybe it was instinct, I'm unsure. I stood there for maybe five minutes and slowly the feeling faded. I wasn't really in the mushy hunting mood anymore but figured I'd finish it off and maybe come out this way again if I found something. I fucking found something indeed. About another 30 minutes into my walk I came across this clearing maybe 50 or 60 meters across and just all mud. I figured I must have found someone's patch where they grow weed and they've recently tugged out all the plants because it's getting too cold and they needed to harvest and all the walking they did just fucked up the ground. But I couldn't settle on that. It wasn't quite right, something was missing. I figured it out standing there. No leaves on the ground, no pile of dead plants anywhere to be seen, it was just an empty clearing. However, there were tracks all around so someone was here at some point. I walked a bit out into the clearing and started looking at the tracks. Seemed like people walked around here a lot. Boot prints, dog prints, more boot prints, but different boots. Then I saw something fucking strange. Just regular human feet prints. You know when you see something that doesn't make sense immediately and you stop to think about it and kinda come out of autopilot mode? That's what happened, then the bad. No sound at all, no birds, no fucking anything. That feeling suddenly came back, like a feral wave to the mind, and I started dry retching, but like, you know how when you heave it takes a second or two before it happens again? It wasn't like that, it was continuous. I'd heave then immediately suck in air and go again. I started shaking enough for it to draw my attention, so I looked down at my hands, but I couldn't really see them, everything was unfocused and foggy. I finally got to nope time. I'd had enough of this bullshit and I was going to go home and make a nice drink and everything was going to be fine again. I was wrong. I'm home now and I've had my drink and everything is not fine at all. It went fucking wrong when I caught movement while looking up. I was still on my side of the clearing so about 40 meters from me as my heed came level. Its foot hit the ground from leafy under coverage to mud in the clearing and then it stopped stock still. Absolutely no movement. I can't match it to any animal, but what jumps to mind is definitely... What's the faggot's name? Mr. Lupin? The Harry Potter film. Pick related. There were some major differences, though. Its skin was completely fucking hairless and much more pale. Looked almost translucent, but I couldn't make out any color. Thinking about it now, it's hard to imagine not seeing blood vessels or something. Something to tell me it was alive. Growing hair, blood vessels, a scratch or a scrape, anything would have been enough. It was just one solid, pale color. It was standing upright with a slight hunch around the shoulders. Similar to a human, if you bring your shoulders up and push them forward a bit, you'll understand what I mean. Very similar facial structure to pick related, but less elongated. The thing that really got me was there was absolutely no emotion until our eyes met. There was some sort of recognition in its eyes, but nothing else. At this moment, I knew I was a dead man walking. Pick related. Fuck see fuck Jesus. 
It's all ruined. Have you ever had a nightmare where you're getting chased by something, but you can't run? You try to run, but you can't, and struggle and try all you like, there's just nothing you can do. In the dreams, that emotion usually fades after you wake up, and you don't really have a solid grasp of that emotion. Same exact feeling, but now I can remember it. Have you ever watched a stoat kill a rabbit? The rabbit sits there and screams as the stoat walks up to it, keeping eye contact the entire time. The rabbit is just so instilled with fear, it's incapable of movement. I was the rabbit. I was prey. I was dead. I knew I was dead, and it knew it too. That's when it took another step out and into the clearing. Perfectly fluid movement, at least eight, maybe nine feet tall. It kept eye contact with me this entire time. I heard dogs barking. I assume now that a farmer was moving some sheep from one paddock to another. That barking saved my life. Whatever it is looked away from me for a brief second to the direction of the noise. We broke eye contact and I took my first breath in what felt like a really long time. Maybe seven or eight seconds in reality. I turned heel and started running full tit towards the noise of the dogs. The bush isn't too thick around here. I got a fair pace going, and for a second I thought I'd be okay, but I definitely wasn't going to be okay. After another second's thought, its movement was impeccable. It did catch me, and I knew that. Something about this realization gave me an added boost of adrenaline. My legs were stretching to maximum capacity with every stride. I must have been moving about 50 or 60 kilometers an hour for a solid five minutes at least. And that's a pretty conservative estimate. During that time, I could hear it moving through the brush behind me. First, a wet slap of feet, paws, claws on the ground as it went through the clearing. Then the crackle of sticks and leaves as it went into the bush behind me. Heavy, though, with a thump to every step. Then I started hearing it, breathing but not like my own, not the short, sharp breaths I was taking to fuel my lungs. They were slow and deep. It wasn't even trying. I wasn't even worth putting in serious effort in order to catch me. As that thought crossed my mind, it was replaced with the next thought. Paddock, fence, safety, then the next two thoughts. Where is it? Where's its noise? I went straight over that fence, no hesitation. Jumped the fucker. Saw the farmer and went straight towards him. He was sitting on his quad and only saw me after I was halfway through the paddock. He jumped off that bike faster than I've ever seen an old man move. Going for a gun on the back of his quad. Thinking about it now, I completely understand his reaction. Crazed-looking male running towards him at 7.30 in the morning out of bush, where I had absolutely no reason to be, covered in mud, scratches all over my face. Before he'd actually gotten the rifle out of its protector, I'd reached him, turned around to look at the bush I'd come from, and backed up until I was standing by his side. He had stopped going for the gun, was looking at me then, looking at the bush, then back at me. Are you okay, son? He asked. I looked away from the bush, towards him and replied, yeah. The fucking look in his eyes. He saw my fear, my absolute terror. He shared that feeling with me for a brief second before I started walking in the direction of home. I was in shock. I should have asked him for help. I walked for three hours, staying very clear of the bush. My mind was racing. What was that thing? What was that knock on the fence? What did that farmer think? Am I going to get collected by the police and put in the plastic spoons and forks, ward in the insane asylum? Should I be in the plastic spoons and forks ward? I got to somewhere familiar. I'd looked for mushies in this paddock before. I was five minutes away from home and relative safety. I just had to cross the stream and walk up the road. The stream connected to the bush the bush where it lived. It took me another 45 minutes to coax up the courage to do what needed to be done. I just wanted to be home. I wanted to curl up into a ball and cry in the comfort of my room. So I did it. I ran straight at and through the stream and to the other side. 
back to concrete roads. That felt so good. I was euphoric. I was wearing a fedora and opening doors for women. Yet again, I still wasn't good. That feeling just creeps up your spine, like running a popsicle stick through your two top and bottom front teeth while biting down. I can't get away from it. I've been feeling it the rest of the day. It's not so bad anymore, but it was just like in the bush when I got home. It's 1.32 p.m. right now. And now I'm sitting in front of my computer typing this out. This is also where I'm in need of some serious help. What the fuck is going on here, X? I haven't seen Matt yet and he's always up by now. My cat Bruno is limping and I've simply just got no idea what to do. Any advice, please? Ali Police Department Employees Report. Subject. Recovered camcorder and mini DV tape. Date and time occurred. 12 17 02 17 24 hours to 12 18 02 0 Sao 24 hours. Location of occurrence Superior National Forest, Approxes 1 Mile NW Mitchell Lake. 2 Rank Name Assignment Officer Pat Gundrick, Detective Date and Time Reported 1 22 03 16 30 hours. Date and Time Typed 1 23 03 4 25 hours. Details on 122.03 at approximately 16.30 hours. Two hikers entered the police station with a camcorder they claimed to have found in the woods northwest of Mitchell Lake. Hikers gave their names as Eric Jordan Jacobson and Lorraine Minerva Jacobson. Left contact information, printed below. I thanked them and asked that they not leave town until I had examined the evidence. The couple complied and are currently lodged at a nearby hotel. The camcorder, Canon ZR40, was heavily weathered and covered in some areas with patches of ice, suggesting that it has endured long exposure to the elements. It is beyond repair. Inside the camera was a mini-DV cassette tape I discovered after forcing the tape deck open. The tape was full. After examining the rest of the camcorder and filing it in the evidence locker, item 11659A, I returned to the mini-DV tape. The Ely Police Department does not possess the technology to review mini-DV tapes, so to aid the case, I took the tape home to review on my own camcorder. The contents of the tape are given below, 12 17 17 24 hours. The tape begins with a shot of a Welcome to Duluth sign. The individual behind the camcorder narrates, There we are, just got dropped off in lovely Duluth. The time is now. His watch comes into view, about 5.30. By this time tomorrow I should be back in Ontario. Time to get some food and, uh, see if I can get another ride. End shot. 12, 17, 1750 hours. The individual is in a diner. There is a large plate of scrambled eggs and hash browns in front of the individual. He seems to be recovering from a fit of laughter. Have you ever seen this? Laughter. Look at these eggs. He picks up a fork and stabs a bit of egg, holding it up to the camera. The egg is glistening in the fluorescent light, pale and covered in a buttery oil. He continues to laugh. I can't believe I'm eating this. When I get home, I want a steak. A steak. Do you hear me? It is unclear who the individual is addressing here, as they are never mentioned by name. The camera turns out the window to see the sun setting to the west. Damn. Gotta go. End shot. 12 17 02 1938 hours. The camera focuses on a road sign that says US 53. The cameraman sounds angry. Not a goddamn one. I've been walking for 15 miles. Not one person stops. He turns the camera to face the oncoming traffic and begins to yell, Assholes! It's fucking cold out here! His arm stretches into view as he raises his middle finger. Two cars pass. I gotta put this away. Can't even feel my hands. End shot. 12 17 02 2024 hours. The camera is still trained on the freeway. It bobs up and down as the cameraman walks. He is silent. 12 17 02 2031 hours. A semi slows down and approaches the shoulder. The cameraman's demeanor changes. Seriously? Yes, finally. God, I've been freezing out here. It is too dark to read the license plate as the semi approaches. The cameraman hurriedly shoves the camera into his duffel. He neglects to turn it off. The truck driver says he can only take the cameraman as far as Eagle's Nest Township. Names are never exchanged. 12 17 02 20 33 hours to 22 17 hours. The two talk. The voice identified as the cameraman's discusses his recent graduation from the University of Denver and his plans to travel the country until he decides to settle down. 
The semi-driver says little, mostly listening to the cameraman talk. When he does talk, the driver has a raspy voice, and there is a consistent sound of coughing, followed by the opening of a window and spitting. 12, 17, orzo, 2, 2224 hours. The driver informs the cameraman that they've arrived at Eagle's Nest. The cameraman expresses a grateful thank you. There is some shuffling and a door slamming as the cameraman gets out of the truck. Under his breath, he says, Guy was weird. Pulling out a flashlight, he begins to walk. A road sign shows he's traveling east on MN-169, 12 17 2 2258 hours. The cameraman passes Robinson Lake, talking to nobody in particular. Still pretty damn cold out. I see some lights up ahead. Must be that town the driver was talking about. The camera faces Ely. Hopefully I can get another ride before then. In 02 2301 hours. In reviewing the tape, something here catches my eye. As the cameraman walks past the lake, something moves in the extreme right of the frame. It is impossible to say what as the camera records very poorly at night, catching only what is illuminated by the flashlight. There is nothing to suggest the cameraman sees whatever is in the tree line. For lack of better description, the darkness of the tree line seems almost to shake or turn and fade back into the forest like a moving shadow. 12 17 teen, 02 2336 hours, the cameraman sings softly to fill the silence of the road. Approximately one mile east of Wolf Lake, there is a soft whining out of the shot. The cameraman turns with a start, shining his flashlight. He sees a dog, injured and limping badly. The dog seems domesticated, and as the cameraman slowly approaches light glints from its collar, the dog's left hind leg is broken. The cameraman takes on a gentle demeanor. Hey boy, are you hurt? Come here, come here. He walks toward the dog. The dog gets up and cowers, trying to keep distance between the cameraman and itself. As the cameraman gets closer, the dog turns and begins to limp into the forest. Hey, where are you going? I'm not gonna hurt you. Flashlight in hand, the cameraman enters the woods. 12, 17, 02, 23, 40 horse. The dog remains in full sight of the camera, limping away at a slow pace. The cameraman attempts to get closer. Come on, you're only gonna hurt that leg more. Come here and I'll take you to town. They gotta have a vet. Suddenly, the dog's ears perk. It looks upward, head jerking from one area of the night sky to another. It emits a low, feeble whine. What's wrong, boy? The cameraman turns his camera skyward, seeing only the moon and some low clouds. There is rustling, and as the camera comes back down, the dog is seen running from the camera as though its leg were perfectly healthy. It disappears from the camera's field of vision. Wait. The cameraman begins running after the dog. 12, 17, bot, 23, 40 odd hours. After a moment, the cameraman hears a howl of pain straight ahead of him. Running even faster, he enters a small clearing, a pond northwest of Mitchell Lake, and sees the dog's crumpled body. He approaches slowly, shining the light on the dog. Bending down, the cameraman checks for a pulse. Dead. He gets to his feet, stepping back from the carcass. His camera and flashlight sweep the clearing and nearby woods. He sees nothing. Turning back to the dog, he mutters quietly. What the hell? Suddenly the ground drops out from under the cameraman. The camera whirls around viciously. The tree line begins to fall away, and then the camera briefly stops rising. It has been either dropped or released, and for a brief moment catches the cone of light on the ground some fifty feet below, still glowing on the body of the dog. Then it falls to earth, hitting the snow with a thump. It is turned toward the sky. The cameraman is barely visible, arms flailing as he rises higher and higher. Long after his body disappears, the camera still hears him screaming. 12 17 02 2353 hours to 12 18 02 0024 hours. The camera gazes upward. The moon slowly arcs across the sky. At your zoto four hours, the tape runs out. After talking with the Ontario Provincial Police, there is no missing persons report filed on or around 121802. After visiting the site, there is no evidence of anything shown on the tape, though considering more than a month has passed, this is not unusual. 
There are currently no theories regarding what occurred on 12-17 through 2 one 3 51 hours. There is no bird native to Minnesota strong enough to lift a full-grown man, and there is no sound on the tape to suggest flapping wings. The only noise is wind whipping past the camera's microphone and the cameraman screaming. Ultimately, this case defies explanation. It is my opinion that this tape be shown to state or federal authorities in hope that they may understand what happened the night of the 17th or at least have access to someone who might. Until that time, this case must be considered closed pending further investigation. Sorry for taking so long. I had class and legends from Galicia are surprising hard to find. I'll do more research once I get home and onto my PC in seven hours or so. But in the meantime, enjoy this messy thing I found about Baby Agora, which is in the western part of Galicia and in the center of southern Poland. Babi Agora, the highest point in the Beskidi Mountains, 1,725 meters above sea level, along with Diablak, Tien, Devil's Peak, roughly. Its strangely named peak that always seems to be shrouded in fog has borne witness to many spine-chilling events. Maybe it's because, according to legends, Babi Agora was the place of witches' sabbaths, which is where it gets its name, Tien. Baba means woman or crone. Meanwhile, Diablak was home to a demonic castle, the only present remnant of which is a massive pile of stones. In the area, crossroads are traditionally called pitchforks, mysterious plain catastrophes. In the summer of 1963, on a clear and beautiful day, a helicopter crashed into Babi Agora. The pilot and passengers died. The cause of the crash was never determined. In 1969, a plane crashed into the side of the mountain. Rangers recovered 53 bodies from the wreck. Nobody on board survived. It's been suggested that the flight instruments failed and the pilot, flying in the fog, didn't see the mountain. But this explanation is not entirely satisfactory. Journeys to the nightmare world of mountains are always dangerous. Nobody in their right mind journeys to the Alps or Pyrenees without proper equipment, boots and clothing. Yet some Polish tourists have ventured forth without exercising even basic safety precautions. One of the trips to Babi Agora that ended in an unfortunate and unlikely way was a group of tourists from Silesia, who on a June evening took a stroll towards the peak. The ladies in nice shoes and light dresses and the men in just shirts and no jackets. They were halfway to the shelter when the air cooled rapidly and it began to snow. With near zero visibility, the freezing tourists decided to take shelter underneath a rock overhang as they couldn't walk farther. They yelled for help. The rangers were alerted after a few hours. After a difficult search, they managed to find the stupid group, but some of them had already frozen to death. One of the men who had been calling for help had frozen with his mouth open, his frozen vocal cords making not a sound. One winter, a group of four skiers was surprised by a sudden change of the weather and falling darkness. The host of the shelter in Marko Ischewini was worried by their long absence and organized a search. On the morning of the third day, near Kosholki, a pair of women's skis without poles were found, and later a pair of men's skis, also without poles. After many hours, somebody spotted one of the skiers frozen in the snow. He had not taken off his skis and had frozen in a snowdrift some two dozen meters below the shelter. 130 meters away, the body of the second skier, a 19-year-old girl, was found buried under the snow. A hundred meters from the shelter, the body of the second girl was found. The body of the last skier wasn't found until mid-May, in a dense patch of forest, 200 meters from a forest ranger's hut. Biestjadi, have you been where the devil says goodnight? Have you ever been in the Biestjadi Mountains? If not, you should be sorry, as it is still an area of wild and uncorrupted nature. And the mountains called Polonini, though they look gentle, are not easy for inexperienced hikers. People say that in the 70s, a black horse used to wander around the Wetlinska Polonina. People, though there aren't many of them in the area, would smack their lips at it, wanting to feed it bread. The horse would whinny, run away a bit and stop, waiting for the people to follow. Those who did would lose the trail and fall into holes, twisting their ankles. Then the horse would dissolve onto the fog. 
How is it possible that this part of Poland lacks fantastical names? With one exception, Smolnik. Tn, derived from Tar. Bieszczady comes from Bies, meaning devil. It's possible that Bies was the one taking the shape of the horse. No bully, I typed this whole thing on my phone. Anyway, here's another source. There are several theories as to the source of the name of the mountain. One of the most famous legends of the area states that the mountains are piles of stones gathered by a giantess for her garden. Another, much more romantic story, talks about the lover of a bandit, who was so full of sorrow after his death that she turned to stone. Another story claims that the baby, women, that the name refers to were women kidnapped by bandits as wives and kept in one of the area's caves. A bandit also appears in the story of the Devil's Castle, which is supposed to explain the origin of the peak Diablac. It was on that peak that a great bandit decided to build his castle, and he hired the Devil himself to do it. The Devil, having signed a deal with the bandit, set to work, and was almost done. But when he placed the keystone and the entire castle collapsed, crushing the bandit and allowing the Devil to take his soul. Some say that during a storm, any traveler foolish enough to be at the site can hear unsettling noises coming from underneath the ruins. It was also here that witches were supposed to meet for their Sabbath, although the Holy Cross Mountains are more frequently associated with them. The Germans also suspected the peak of having a demonic origin, formerly calling it the Devil's Mountain.